President Andrew Jackson, our nation's seventh president, lived in a time of change in America with new political and economic systems that would forever change the social dynamics within the country. Jackson was different from the previous presidents because he wasn't from the landed gentry. He was the son of Irish immigrants. who had settled in the Carolinas. Unlike the presidents of the past, he was not raised with money or prestige. As an adult, he lived in Tennessee, where he practiced law. Jackson had raised a reputation for himself during the War of 1812. He led his men to the only true American victory, although it was shortly after the two sides had signed a truce. As president, he claimed to be a voice for the people, and in many ways he achieved that goal. He identified himself as a farmer. Therefore, he sought to protect their needs and disrespected the hypocrisy and cruelty of the upper class. He knew that society could inflict devastating pain upon a person, as it did to his wife, Rachel. Jackson's wife, Rachel, had been in an abusive marriage before fleeing from it in 1790. With the help of Jackson, she ran away while her husband sought a divorce from the Virginia legislature. However, Rachel's husband was granted only a bill stating that he could ask for a divorce in court. He didn't follow through, though, but led people to believe that the divorce was granted anyway. Rachel and Jackson then moved away and got married. Two years later, Rachel's ex-husband finally sued for a divorce, claiming that Rachel was an adulteress. Rachel and Jackson quickly remarried, but it was too late. Rachel's reputation had been tarnished, and the insults began. Jackson vowed to protect and defend Rachel from society's scorn. He fought duel after duel to defend Rachel, answering every insult in sight. During Jackson's 1828 campaign for the presidency, the attacks worsened. Shook up and shot down, she'd suffered two heart attacks, which killed her. Devastated by the death of his beloved wife, Jackson entered the presidency a broken man. One of his first presidential duties was to appoint his cabinet. John C. Calhoun, also known as the Voice of the South, was elected as his vice president. Martin Van Buren was chosen as Jackson's secretary of state. Van Buren was a widower from New York, who, although he had never held a national position, was a strong supporter of Jackson. Samuel D. Ingham was chosen as secretary of treasury. John M. Berrien was chosen as the attorney general and John Branch was chosen as the Secretary of the Navy. All of these men were supporters of Calhoun. John Henry Eaton was chosen as the Secretary of War. This appointment was seen as a poor decision because of Eaton's recent marriage to the scandalous lady Margaret Peggy O'Neill Timberlake Eaton. Peggy Eaton was the daughter of an innkeeper in D.C. By many, she was described as having a well-rounded, voluptuous figure, peach-pink complexion, large, active, dark eyes, and full, sensuous lips, ready to break it into an engaging smile. She worked as a barmaid in her father's tavern, and there made friends with many senators and congressmen. Because of her liberal upbringing, Peggy was more comfortable with the opposite sex and therefore spoke more freely. In 1816, Peggy was 17. John Bowie Timberlake, a 39-year-old former Navy pursuer, caught sight of Peggy and knew that she was the one for him. That evening, he had asked and received permission, and by July, they were married. Timberlake and Peggy lived in a house across the street from Peggy's father's tavern. Timberlake was already in debt from his time in the Navy, so he opened a store nearby. It was not a success, which added to his financial problems. In 1818, the Timberlakes met John Eaton, a widowed senator. Timberlake and Eaton became good friends. Timberlake was going further and further into debt. His only option was to return to the Navy. Peggy and her daughter stayed behind at her father's tavern. While she helped out at the tavern, nicknamed the Franklin House, Peggy began to develop a reputation for being too bold. She would discuss politics, share her opinion, and generally do things that women ought not to do especially women with a husband away at sea. 
During this time, Eaton was frequently Peggy's companion. Spending so much time together, combined with Peggy's new reputation, led to gossip hinting that Peggy and Eaton were having an affair. Timberlake was only able to come home for short, occasional visits. Away at sea, Timberlake suffered from anxiety and depression. He died at sea in 1828, a suicide. Gossip spread that Timberlake had killed himself while drunk, unable to bear his wife's affair with John Eaton. Whether this was true or not, soon after, Eaton, conf Eaton confessed his love to Peggy, and they were soon married in 1829. This went against the customs of society. Women were expected to wait at least a year before remarrying. This produced even more gossip about Peggy. Life in Washington involved not only the powerful men of the country, but also their wives. For the cabinet members, it was customary that their wives call on each other and leave a calling card. When the Eatons first arrived in Washington, they visited the home of Calhoun and his wife, Floride. They were greeted warmly, but the next day, Mrs. Calhoun did not return the call. This set the precedence for the further slightening of Peggy. The wives of cabinet members saw Peggy as someone whose behavior and morality could be questioned. No matter how bad it got for her, though, Peggy refused to give up her outspoken ways. People were afraid that Peggy, with her outspokenness and unguarded political opinions, would shape John Eaton's decision in the cabinet. When times got hard, Peggy would often turn to her good friend, Andrew Jackson, who was able to sympathize with her pain, and is quoted to have said, Jackson saw the attacks on Peggy as not only an attack on a friend, but also an attack on him and his presidency. Jackson quickly jumped in and joined the battle, protecting Peggy. One of his supporters, the Reverend Ezra Ellie, tried to warn Jackson about Peggy and the bad influence she could have on her husband, and therefore on Jackson's cabinet. He accused her of lacking morals, citing her bad reputation. Jackson defended Peggy. Jackson debunked some of Ellie's claims, but Ellie refused to back down. Henry Clay, too, joined in the abuse. Vice President Calhoun and the other members of the cabinet, prompted by their wives, would have nothing to do with Peggy. This infuriated Jackson and began to interfere with the running of government. The continued attacks on Peggy and Jackson's continued defense created a growing divide within the cabinet. On the side of Peggy stood her husband, Jackson, and Martin Van Buren, a widower who was not under the command of any woman. Both John C. Calhoun and Martin Van Buren wanted to succeed Jackson as president. There were intense rivals who disagreed mostly over states' rights, Calhoun supporting state nullification. Until the Eaton Affair began to erupt, John C. Calhoun had been a strong-minded vice president, but had generally supported Jackson's policies. He was the expected successor to the presidency. As Jackson's rage over Peggy's rejection grew, Calhoun's position began to slip. Martin Van Buren saw this as an opportunity. Then, in 1831, Van Buren resigned from his position. Eaton soon followed. Jackson used these resignations as an excuse to ask the remainder of his cabinet to step down in order to help him reorganize. With the cabinet now clear of people against Peggy and Calhoun supporters, Jackson was able to name new cabinet members. Jackson, now with new cabinet members who supported him, attempted to appoint Van Buren as the U.S. Minister to Great Britain, but the nomination was blocked by Calhoun. In 1832, Jackson once again ran for president. However, this time, Jackson left Calhoun off the ballot, instead running with Van Buren as vice president, and paving the way for Van Buren's presidency. Meanwhile, Calhoun retreated to the South, where he advocated states' rights, eventually leading to the nullification crisis. But the story of Peggy Eaton was not over yet. 
After her husband died in 1845, she, now 59, married the young 19-year-old dance instructor of her granddaughter. People once again ostracized her. The marriage was a failure. Not long after the vows were made, the dance teacher ran away with Peggy's granddaughter, and Peggy was left to care for her grandson for the remainder of her life.